Welcome back to another edition of Higher Education Today. I'm your host, Stephen Roy Goodman. I'm here at the University of Cape Town. We'll be talking about women's and gender studies. Dr. Mary Hames is director of the Gender Equity Unit at the University of the Western Cape. Welcome. Uh, good morning, Steve, and thanks for having me. I'm delighted you're here. Maybe if we could start, Mary, with the Gender Equity Unit. What is the Gender Equity Unit at UWC, and what is a Gender Equity Unit at, at other universities? This is the oldest of its kind uh, on the continent, in the country, and I think generally on, on the globe. Uh, the Gender Equity Unit actually started, or people started to talk about support for women in particular in the higher education environment in the midst of apartheid. So it was the late 80s when there was apartheid was more, the apartheid struggle was more about the racial struggle and inequities. Uh, but women, feminists and men supporting feminists at the University of the Western Cape said, look, there are so many inequities between women and men. And um, so the rector then, Jake Scherwell, said, draw up a list. So they've, and, and so where the university is actually doing wrong to women. And it was about sabbaticals, it was about promotions, there were no women was professors, it was about uh, maternity benefits, it was about housing subsidies, it was about uh, medical insurance. So these women then, when they formed the Women's Commission and they drew up a whole list and then they handed it to the, the rector. And um, they then decided that to actually address all the inequities and inequalities that exist, that there should be a particular unit that's looking at policy development and then evaluating and monitoring to see whether these things are happening. Now you have to understand, here people are fighting against racial inequalities, but women said, if we are not part, we cannot be free. Um, we, so we have to address both. We cannot wait till the one struggle is over and then we have another struggle for women. Well, it's interesting you say that because when I was at UWC in the early 90s, uh, there was a lot of concern about that, that women were somehow being left behind. Mm -hmm. uh, is that not the case today? I think we, we often say that we've started South African feminism and, and, and rights for women. So. The Gender Equity Unit was in, uh, started formally in 1993. Um, and, and Rhoda Kadali was then the, the first gender equity officer on campus, but she was also a lecturer in the anthropology department. But then th they said one of the visions was actually to have policies for women. And then in 1994, when the first democratic elections, uh, we've become very involved in actually seeing that the country has gender sensitive, women and gender sensitive laws, um, like your labor laws, your employment equity laws. Uh, I mean, even the, the, uh, in the, the clause in the Constitution, Section 9, that's actually, called, we call it the Equality Clause. I mean, we had a lot of input into that because by then the University of Western Cape, the feminists there, they were, you know, we had a lot of experience in it. The first sexual harassment policy was developed at the Gender Equity Unit at, at the UWC. So we were progressive way before the country even woke up to say, you know, we must have these things. Well, that's interesting. Perhaps you can explain a little bit, if you don't mind, about what situation affects women today in South Africa. How would you characterize how women are doing in South Africa today, not just at UWC, but in the country generally? I think there was a moment when we were all very euphoric. Like I said, the, 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 the very first feminist uh, law that was um, passed by Parliament was, for instance, the Termination of Pregnancy Act. So it was, uh, women now had a choice. I mean, that is what feminism is also all about a choice about their bodies and what to do, whether they want to have children, whether they want to terminate their pregnancy. So, so that was a milestone. Then the 1995 uh, uh, labor laws was actually looking at it. It was also the first time that there was a kind of a, a policy around sexual harassment for, for women in the workplace. I mean, put in place, it's a legal instrument. Uh, uh, women can't take recourse. But as time went on, 
we saw that the, the implementation of these laws, you know, lagged far behind the, the, the choices that women are supposedly to have. I mean, there was also um, in, 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 in government, this, the Office on the Status of Women was established. It was a gender commission. So your whole legal framework was actually supposed to be conducive to women. But we see it, it doesn't happen. I mean, this year alone, uh, let me see, between April last year and December 2016, I mean, there were more than 30,000 uh, people killed in this country. I mean, this year alone. I'm in, sorry, in can you repeat that number? More than 30,000. 33,000. 30,000 people were killed yeah. in South Africa. Yeah. And many of them were women. It was not, and I mean, we're in a time of peace and there's no wars, it's here, but the, the war is in, in the house, the war is on the street against women and, and, and particularly girl children. And, and I mean, in the Western Cape this year, we've had about 40 children already and young women that were raped and killed. So that says about, for me, the barometer of, of society. Um, um, uh, lesbians in, in this country, in particular black lesbians in the townships, I mean, their lives are at risk, I mean, 24-7. So, so we say we have this marvelous, generous laws. I mean, the equality clause in our constitution looks at race, gender, women, sexual orientation, um, disability, etc., religion, etc. So why is it that our society lags behind? What do you think is the disconnect between the laws that exist through the Constitution of South Africa and what's on the ground today? I think there's a lot of factors that, that, that that's involved. I think that, that our country is still one of the most unequal societies. So, so and we come through, a, 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 um, and I'm not making excuses for violence, any kind of violence, but we come from a very violent past. We both, the, the, the apartheid regime was responsible for extreme forms of violence. But then we also had the, the people who, who were fighting against apartheid. There was also a lot of violence that we are not even, these kinds of things have not even been recorded uh, at this particular uh, a moment. I think there's a lot of research that's still to be done to say what happened in the military camps. We now know what happened um, uh, to a lot of uh, uh, white soldiers in the South African National Defense Force. We see, for instance, uh, I mean, there's now a court case that they're investigating one of the, 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 the killings that happened under the, the security police watch. Um, that's now been investigated, but we have never been really investigated what happened in the freedom struggle in the, the camps that was outside the country. So people say it's about education, but I think uh, this is a deep-seated kind of misogyny in, in our country. There's a deep-seated uh, kind of, that the patriarchy is, is um, alive, well and alive in our country. And, 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 I, and, and these kinds of things, I mean, cipher through to society. I say, I mean, don't even talk about the ordinary person on the street. But if the people are, are in the responsible and accountable positions, that are actually perpetrating these things. What kind of example is it? The violence, is, it's, for me, it's in the body. And it's an embodiment of violence. But what should a university do about that then? The universities, I think we are just one part of, 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 of all societies and a very small sector of, 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 of people are actually at the university. If we have got 52, 53 million people in our country and there's um, only a couple of hundreds of thousands of students. 
uh, at our university. I think our biggest university is a distance education university. So there's not that contact and that's the University of South Africa. So for instance, if UCT has got about 25,000 students, UWC about 22,000 students. So your bigger universities, University of Johannesburg, 30,000 students. Now if you actually add those students up, it doesn't even amount to too many if I'm not mistaken, you had some or have some ties or had some ties to Penn State University. Yes, I, I serve on the advisory board of the, the African Feminist in, in Initiative and most recently we've met in, 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 in Morocco because it's, it's also um, a large contingent of, of uh, women from the continent that's part of, of that initiative. But what, what happened is that one of the professors there saw our production because I also produce plays with my students was actually speaking against violence uh, against women through drama. And they write their own narratives and we put it together as, as uh, theatre productions. We were then invited to perform at uh, Penn State. And what, we, what they then said is because we want also those students because the narratives of violence at the universities are basically the same. So, so we then said, okay, fine, I'll bring six students over and they, we will use three of their students and we will jointly then work on their narratives in, in collaboration with the narratives that we bring. And that's, that's how I got involved at Penn State. That's interesting. And so from your perspective, were the narratives of the Penn State students different from the narratives of the UWC students? No, there were a lot of similarities, a lot of similarities. And I think what was also touching, there was a one particular narrative of a student that was born on the continent, but her parents then uh, emigrated to the United States. And what difficulty it was there to be uh, like an immigrant growing up, like a foreigner in that country. And I mean, at that point in time, we in South Africa also struggled with, even with our own, the, the, the kind of xenophobic attacks that, that happened here. So, so it was like talking across the ocean about journeys that's different but yet similar. And speaking of those journeys, so could we delve into that a little bit? So, um, so what are some of the journeys that female students at both UWC and perhaps Penn State are going through that you think specifically are, 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 are in common? For two years now, we've had, um, this is almost the third year, that we have the student protests on campus. It, it, it's how uh, young women are being ignored within the broader narratives of universities. And I think that is why the Gender Equity Unit also started. It was not about being equal to anybody, all right? But it was about having equitable opportunities, uh, access to education, what kind of access? For me, access to education, for instance, for a young woman student is quite different from that of a young man student because there are different things that come to play. And then, and then, and then I think that is also what happened during the protests where, uh, of the students, so they, they, they actually articulated that kind of things. They said, why are we being left out of these narratives? Um, write us into the stories of, because we, this, I mean, statistics show that there are m many more women coming to university. So on your undergraduate level, we have a large percentage of women. I mean, I think a couple of years ago at our university, it was 60, 40, 60% women there and 40% of, of uh, men students. But then what happens, the higher they go, you know, postgraduate studies, fewer women into postgraduate studies. And, I, and I've, my uh, uh, theory is that already as an 18 year old, and we take the media age of 18, when you come to campus as a woman, you actually make certain choices. You make compromises with your body, with your family, with the bursary holders, etc. Et and you say, okay, fine, for this period, if I don't have a child, I won't have a child because I have to compromise. But then, uh, because at postgraduate level, they say, okay, I have to make a choice, earning money, have a professional career, or having a family 
while working. So, so these kinds of things, you know, and, and I think sometimes subconsciously people, and that is why I say the first feminist law that was passed by this country was around termination of pregnancy, was also about fighting for maternity benefits, because, and I mean, way back, way back in the 80s, in the 70s, the, the women in the unions in this country fought for maternity benefits. The irony, of course, is that men benefit too by that because when we say we want paternity benefits, we, uh, maternity benefits, we say it, but the man is also responsible as a parent. So we also fought for paternity benefits so that they can get time off also to become responsible parents. So, so when men also always fought for rights for them, women have also said, let's just be inclusive. And is it working? Is it working? We, do, we hope so. <laughs> we haven't measured it, but we, we are pushing for, for always for, for, for that kind of equitable approach. Uh, at our universe in particular, we also say, for instance, if you adopt a child, uh, that as a parent to adopt, that you should have equal uh, parental benefits and, and, and leave. So a couple of years ago, there was this couple that adopted, um, they claimed that when there was a natural pregnancy, the, his woman partner got mat maternity benefit. So he said it's now his turn to get paternity benefit and the university allowed it. So, and then I think things are, are, are changing. Well, I guess I wanted to get back to the issue of how mm. South Africa was different from other places. Mm. Because what you just said a second ago, I, I think somebody who would have a similar job to you at the United States might say. They might say, well, you know, we're fighting for some of these same issues. Mm. And I understand that. I guess what I'm interested in, and I think American viewers would be interested in, is there something unique about the universities in South Africa where the struggles are a little bit harder, maybe they're a little bit easier. So what's unique about the struggles that women are going through on campuses here, as opposed to perhaps in the United States? I think what is unique here is that we have learned from what's happening glo globally. And, and sat down, and then I've been uh, talking to people um, in the States and elsewhere, is, I mean, we are way ahead just having a gender equity unit. This physical, sometimes you have similar kinds of structures um, at other universities, but it doesn't do the same work. It doesn't come from the same uh, um, ethos and philosophical grounding. And I think that is um, what is important. I mean, way back, um, I mean, our laws are so advanced. I mean, the, the United States, I mean, same-sex unions, uh, was way after we've had it already, and it was a long and protracted struggle. Um, so so there's, there's a lot of theorization around these things. There's a lot of work being done there. But when you, I actually speak with my counterparts there, I realize that we have had these things for such a long, long time that I sometimes think we've become complacent. I've been recently talking to a, a group of young women and they said, you come and you think we've had these things, but it was a long, long struggle uh, to have it. And, 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 and we are in the process of constantly reviewing it. I mean, in comparison with the rest of the continent, South Africa is so way ahead. I mean, you cannot talk about termination of pregnancy. Um, in any of the other countries in, in those contexts. I was for years also involved in, in, in a publication um, brought in by the SADC uh, Research Unit, um, and we called it uh, Beyond Inequalities. But every time that we have to put our chapters together in our booklets, you know, it is like, whew. <laughs> other people, it's not even on paper there. In terms of the initiation uh, ceremonies, I believe that they're for men only. The ones where, if I understand this correctly, that young men go to the mountains and the boys become men. They still have that in different parts of South Africa, I'm not mistaken. 
Yes, it's different cultures have different practices. But I think there's also a kind of practice because with, I think with the HIV and AIDS uh, pandemic, that they said it is for, you know, it is good that all men become circumcised because it reduced the risk, whether that is true or not, I, I've, <laughs> I have no idea. But it's in certain um, uh, cultures that circumcision happens. But I mean, even there, there's, there's a compromise to have it done at a, uh, at a medical um, institute and then go for the other cultural education elsewhere. So, yeah. Well, if we can continue on the culture for a second. Yeah. So my understanding is that some of the cultural aspects of these rites of passage are, are, are very much based on whether you're male or female. I assume that that comes at loggerheads with some of the aspects of what's in the Constitution. Our Constitution is basically based on universal human rights. And that is why I say for us, you know, the equality clause in the Constitution is, is a very important clause and whatever happens, you go back there if you challenge. There's a particular chapter that, that, that's for the governance of traditional leaders, but there's also the paradox of having and, and embracing the equality clause that it's based on the universal human rights. Now the, the, the South Africa is a signatory without reservations of many of the UN declarations and conventions. CEDAW, that's uh, the convention of to end all discrimination against women. Uh, like I said, that's one of the conventions the South African government signed without any reservation. So he didn't say, I won't sign this paragraph or this section, et, et cetera. So, so in the traditional culture, if polygamy is allowed, one of the things that they say is a harmful practice to women is polygamy. So, so the, those are the kinds of, of clashes that's there. So whether we want to talk about or not embroider it, we have to take these things in, into consideration. So, so what South Africa is also supposed to do is to every year write a report to the United Nations and say, this is what we've done, uh, this is how it goes. Uh, and there are a number of years that no report was submitted. So the, the, the non-government organizations then started a movement where they have what they call shadow reports. Then they would say, these things have not been, these things are actually uh, um, paradoxical within what is in our constitution and what's supposed to happen and what is the United Nations Convention saying. And they then submit shadow reports to the United Nations. So there are, there are mechanisms in place that's not necessarily, but it's actually highlighting the, the, the contradictions between what is supposed to be legal, what is supposed to be acceptable, and what's not. Well, if we can get to that before we say goodbye today, can mm. we just get to that, that disconnect a little bit more? Mm. So can you give us an example, not necessarily with the United Nations or even mm. with Parliament or even with uh, the Western mm. Cape government, mm. but something involving your family, somebody else's family, where is, is there, how does that clash happen? And how do you resolve those clashes then? I think we've inherited a lot of these things where we had laws, uh, um, even in the oppressive apartheid regime, and we had cultural and practices or even like family traditions going on. And I think there was not, and I don't want to call it a, a marriage, but there was not a, a synchronizing of what is happening. So there were all these parallel things. So um, you'll have a Western wedding, but you will also have a traditional wedding. And, and, and you call yourself a Christian, but you will also do something else. And I'm just using these kinds of examples that say that, I mean, if you, you took, uh, talked about um, uh, circumcision, so we said, I am a Christian, I will do these things, but then also traditionally, culturally, these things have been practiced. And, and it is not that cult culture is not a static thing. So, so um, in some instances, the Western kind of new culture is living happily with the traditional practices. And I'm, you see, I'm, I'm avoid using culture. <laughs>
because some things we are practiced, it's not necessarily culture, but you know, we've become so used through the ages, and I think the sociologists and anthropologists would, would explain it better than I do. Well, you've explained it very well, and, yeah. and thank you for sharing your insights and your time today. Thank you. If you would like additional information about Dr. Hames, please visit uwc.ac.za. If you have comments or suggestions about higher education today, please send an email to our viewer mailbox at highereducationtoday at topcolleges.com. And thank you for watching. We will continue to bring you quality discussions about important matters in today's college and university world. I'm Stephen Roy Goodman, and you've been watching Higher Education Today.